Good morning, everybody. Today, I'd like to take you through a recap of Ezekiel 20 to 24, which is Renz's uh, fourth section in the first half. Um, we'll notice that 24 is a little bit different than the previous chapters. However, he does keep this all together as the fourth part of his um, rhetorical sort of analysis of the book. So let's take a really quick look at the notes here. Point number one is the issue of dating. Ezekiel 21 contains the first mention of a date since 8-1, which is quite a long period of uh, text to go through without another date. <laughs> so I wanted to include for you a quick recap of the dates mentioned in the book via a chart, which you will find in the handout that will be mailed to you. Um, and this chart was something that I received as a student uh, from a good professor, Dr. Daryl Hobson, who borrowed it from um, R.K. Harrison's Introduction to the Old Testament. And I think some of you have already found a similar chart based on the same article, uh, an article by Parker and Dubenstein called Babylonian Chronology. I think I did see one student mention this um, as a dating scheme. And it seems to be fairly well accepted. Um, I found it also in the Jewish Study Bible. Um, and so it's accepted kind of across the board that the dates are fairly um, coordinated with actual dates in real life. Okay, so at 20 we see that it's um, one year after the temple visions in Ezekiel 8 through 11 and the elders approach Ezekiel and they want to inquire of Yahweh. And then at the end of our section we have 24 1 which mentions a date approximately two years later. Um, so if you look at the chart, you'll see that the chrono chronological order in the book is disrupted only by chapter 26.1 and 29.17, and that's pretty good for such a large prophetic book as we've mentioned before. Now, I noticed as I was preparing the note set for this uh, mini lecture or small talk that the English um, numbering of Ezekiel is different to that of the Masoretic text, which is translated in the JPS. So I began using the JPS to make sections and realized that hmm, we have some differences going on here to account for. And I believe Renz mentions that as well. So the first one of these we find at um, 20, <clears throat> 1 to 44, which is 21 to 45 in English. Okay, so the numbering is a little bit different. Um, this is the first of a series of oracle reports marked by our space building term, the word of the Lord came to me saying, and that's important because each time that's mentioned, we can have different topics being addressed by the same addressee, Ezekiel and the Lord in this book. So we have the elders coming, they want to consult Yahweh, but Yahweh refuses and takes a solemn oath. <clears throat> and this is interesting because at 25 and 2031, the mention of Yahweh's honor creates a literary frame around Israel's national shame. <clears throat> okay, so we see that Yahweh's honor is being disrupted by his people's shame. Um, at Ezekiel 2039, which is 2040 in English, there's a mention of my holy mountain, again, as the future location of worship, and that's where the people will know and when the people will know that I am the Lord, according to God. My holy mountain, of course, refers back to Jerusalem. Um, and again, it shifts the idea <clears throat> from the present miserable situation to a future day when people will go there and they'll know that God is God because people will be worshiping there. So it's a, a type of sign. Um, Ezekiel 21 has a series of continued oracle reports. And again, the numbering is slightly different. Um, Ezekiel 21, 1 to 5 in the Hebrew is actually found at 20, 49 to 50 in the English and is addressed to some of Israel's neighbors. Um, Ezekiel 21, 1 to 5 in the English is aimed at Jerusalem, and this is the one of the sword um, oracles, which are really, really vivid. And the promise there is both the righteous and the wicked will be cut off. Now, also in Ezekiel 21, 6 through 13 in the English, we have the sword mentioned. And here, when they mention the sword, it's a metonymy for the war that's coming, okay? So we have a part mentioned for the whole. The sword is the probably the most, excuse the pun, pointed um, uh, aspect of the war. It's the most personal, up-close part of being in a war that these people would resonate with. And um, and yet we don't stop simply with the sword, but there's also a mention of the rod. 
um, and the rod is usually associated with discipline. Okay, um, so we see there that we have this very vivid description of what's going to be happening. And in 21, 14 to 23 in the English, we have some flashy language. Excuse me again, the swords are flashing. Um, and this speaks to the inevitability of the whole situation. Okay, it's going to happen. There's no out here for it now. Um, it's going to be up close. It's going to be personal. It's going to be really not very nice. Ezekiel 21.18 mentions the idea that there were two possible routes for the king of Babylon to follow. One would take them to Rabbah and direct them, him toward the Ammonites, where the other would take him to Judah or Jerusalem. And how then did the king decide which way to go, the king of Babylon? Well, being a good Babylonian, he would probably use divination to decide, make that decision. So there are various ways that that could happen. Number one, there could be an omen. Uh, number two, he could shake arrows, throw them out, and see what they said. Uh, three, he could consult his idols. Or four, something that happened quite a lot in the ancient Near East, although not with the Jerusalemites themselves, was inspecting animal livers. And this has a technical term called extispacy, and you can read about that by looking up that term on Google. Um, it's very interesting to see the role of the animal liver um, as, as something that somebody could read in order to look toward the future. Um, and again, all of these ideas, um, although the lot does fall to Jerusalem, the Babylonian king goes to Jerusalem, any one of these ideas would be things that God would say, don't do this. This is not the way that I want you to make your decisions. God would want them to make the Israelites make their decisions by consulting with him rather than by this secondary or tertiary way of divination. But divination in the ancient Near East is a really fascinating um, topic that probably in a more widely spread prophets class we could go into a little bit more because there's also the idea of um, writing on pottery and the pottery is then tossed to the ground and you'll see sometimes the idea of shards of pottery mentioned in prophetic text as well. This is something that the Egyptians did quite a lot of. And if you go to the museums to look around, you'll end up hearing about how they would use pottery that way. Okay, so let's move on a little bit here. Um, in Ezekiel 21, 24 to 37, we have Ezekiel mentioning the profane and wicked prince of Israel. The king of Israel is being condemned as being both profane, a technical term in the worship idea, um, and wicked, basically the opposite of being righteous and most of the time when we read this in the, in the Hebrew. The idea of profane would be opposed to the idea of um, sacred. Okay, so when we talk about ritual purity, which we've talked about, um, this would imply the opposite, that this prince is really messing up uh, big time in a lot of ways. Okay. At Ezekiel 21, 27, you have a ruin, a ruin, a ruin. This threefold kind of idea is almost like a, a repeated um, refrain here that is representative or reminiscent of ancient Near Eastern texts where the threefold repetition does come in. And you'll find that in Isaiah with the holy, holy, holy is the Lord. So the threefold repetition is something meant to evoke um, a response from people. And here we have the idea not of a positive thing such as God's holiness, but rather the idea of a ruin um, coming into the text. And so it's a quite a nice literary feature here in the text, um, although not a nice message to hear. Okay, Ezekiel 22 has uh, continues a series of oracle reports that are here, marked by the phrase, the word of the Lord came to me saying. Okay, so there's um, three different ones in Ezekiel 22. At 22, 1 through 16, there's the idea of the city stained with blood and defiled by idols. Okay, this is an indictment against the city, um, basically an indictment against the people of the city, but the city is being used as a stand-in for the society as a whole. So there we have a kind of a complex metaphor. Society is a working city. Um, at 22, 17 to 22, we have a shift in imagery. And again, because we have the word of the Lord came to me saying, these make nice dividing um, a, a way to divide the information is also creating a sort of 
coherence in the text because they string one against the other as prophetic oracles, but each one has a little bit different slant. As far as the mining imagery goes, this is a really powerful one for people in the ancient Near East who would understand how mining and, and metallurgy would work. Here, Israel is dross. Dross is what's thrown away. Okay, there's nothing in dross that a metallurgist would want to keep. And here we have God as the smelter. So again, God is the actor in the book of Ezekiel. He's, it's theocentric in the sense that here God is doing what he's going to do. We shift again, imagery-wise, at Ezekiel 22, 23-31 to animal imagery. And this is also very common in the prophetic books at large. We have the phrase, its princes are like a roaring lion, which is, of course, a literary simile because it's using the word like. But it's based on the people are animals conceptual metaphor. And this one is really fascinating because there's probably no better way to insult somebody than to demote him on that hierarchy of, of being, the great chain of being, from being a person to being an animal. Of course, we all know of some very nice animals who behave like people, but in this case, it's, it's meant to be, um, in, on the one hand, insulting, and on the other hand, very descriptive of what lions do. They run around, they make a lot of noise um, prior to indulging in their prey. So this is um, really an indictment against the princes. Now, Ezekiel 23, 1-49 is the last oracle report in this section, and it is an allegory. And we want to remember that an allegory is a form of extended metaphor um, in a sense, but every part needs to have a coordinate in um, what's being compared. So for an allegory really to work, each part has to coordinate to something in the uh, real-life target here. So in this case, we have connections and comparisons being made between Ohola, Samaria, and Oholaba, Jerusalem. Okay, um, And Jerusalem is accused of playing the whore in Egypt. Okay, So we're back again to the society is a person metaphor. Okay, It takes only one whore to um, play the whore, but a whole society is now being sort of personalized in this kind of way. And it, again, is part of that very raw language that Ezekiel uses to get his point across. But it's not only Ezekiel who uses this language. So you can go into Hosea 8, 9, and 10. You can go into Isaiah 7, 1 to 9. And you can also go into Jeremiah 4, 30 um, to see how this all plays out. One of the huge problems of playing the whore in a different country, of course, is the idea of syncretism, in other words, worshiping another god, and apostasy, in other words, turning away from God. And a very vivid example of this is in 2 Kings 16, where Ahaz goes and does things like this right in the temple. Okay, so um, it is a problem. It is a, a, a big problem, and on uh, more levels than just one. So we see political problems with alliances with Egypt, uh, but we also see then uh, worship problems from alliances with Egypt. Now, Ezekiel 24 is the chapter that sort of is acting as a hinge here. Um, and it's dated to the day that the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar actually laid siege to Jerusalem. Okay, so you can confirm that date at 2 Kings 25.1 and Jeremiah 54.2. Okay, so we have um, here in 24, we have the first of first two of three sort of interrelated oracle reports. There's the first one, the allegory of the pot, uh, at 24, 1 to 14. We have then the death of Ezekiel's wife at 24, 15. And then jumping into the next chapter, oracles against Israel's neighbors, immediate neighbors, at 25, 1 to 27. And that one sort of links us to the oracles against the nations, which is the next place we're going to be going. Um, looking at the allegory of the pot and the meat, this is very much imagery that is associated with the priestly behavior uh, that Ezekiel would have been familiar with, which one of the things the priests did was to mind the pots of boiling meat. Um, and again, you can see examples of that in Jeremiah, who also talks about pots being boiled and turned over and purified and so forth. Um, the second one, the death of Ezekiel's wife, is very interesting to me because in a way it's taking the, the part, 
of the society, the prophet and his lost wife, um, and comparing it with the society and their their losses. Okay, so we're taking a microcosm and comparing it to the the macrocosm here, as it were. So that's a really interesting part. Um, and Ezekiel is instructed not to demonstrate his grief, which is quite an interesting thing and probably the one of the most unlikely things for us to want to go and ask somebody to replicate because every each one of us probably knows that uh, grief can't process unless it's actually expressed. And so this is actually God asking Ezekiel to do something that's counter to his re recovery from his grief. Okay. Um, and in that way, um, it might make a really interesting study to kind of dig into that further than what we can um, here today. But these are some of the textual highlights from 20 to 24. And I'll be back with you again with a second short video on the oracles against the nations as the week progresses here. Um, the short talks here are not necessarily meant to be completely informative of everything. That's why we have lots of reading to do. But I do want to use these talks as ways to sort of consolidate main points and to bring up some things that I think are pretty important in the whole scheme of things. So um, if we look at that this way, um, this is why I'm kind of trailing you with, the, with these rather than bringing them up at the very beginning. So um, again, enjoy your reading this week, and we'll look forward to seeing what you come up with on the Oracles Against the Nations in the forums, and we will talk to you soon. Bye now.